So I'm going to ask you a question. All right, I want to challenge you here. So listen to this carefully. How many of you will be prepared to vote for a mandatory universal health care system that required participation of all U.S. inhabitants, whether they're legal or not, and all physicians, with a, a certain exceptions? How many of you would, would vote in favor of that? Okay, that's, actually it's more than I expected, about 25% or so. Okay, I'm going to ask you a second question. How many would be prepared to vote for such a system if medical, medical malpractice suits were severely curtailed, if regulations were cut to a sensible core, and if you were paid 50% more than you currently make for the same effort that you put in right now? Put your hands up, those who agree with that. Okay, we're about 65%, maybe 70%. It was uh, Churchill, don't forget, who um, had a particular adversary, I've forgotten her name in the House of Commons, uh, a lady uh, with whom he was always battling. You remember the one, uh, you know, Mr. Churchill, you're drunk when he comes in late at night. And she, he turns to her and says, yes, madam, and you are ugly. And the only difference is tomorrow I shall be sober. <laughs> well, he also said to the same lady, madam, would you sleep with me for a million pounds? She said, ah, oh, maybe. Well, would you sleep with me for one pound? Well, oh, Mr. Churchill, what do you take me for? Oh, we've already established that. We're only hanging over the price. <laughs> so, uh, the, the point, uh, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this is because the very same question arose 70 years ago in Britain when they were trying to introduce the National Health Service because they had exactly the same problem then as we do have here. And essentially, the physicians were against it. And the, the parliamentarians knew that the physicians would not accept it. And Nye Batten stood up in the House of Commons and said, feed their mouths with gold and they will accept. Now, this might not make us look particularly good as physicians, but the fact is that money does talk. Plus, as you can see from the uh, answers that you've got in the auditorium here, many people here are actually interested in providing universal health care. There must be a way uh, of doing it. So why do we need the FDA? You uh, won't remember, perhaps, that in 1937, uh, the introduction of elixir sulfonilamide actually killed 100 Americans. Uh, thalidomide, which was reduced in Europe in 57, uh, caused uh, many, many uh, deformities in children, which was terrible. Um, uh, you will remember that in two years ago, three years ago, uh, um, uh, these fa facial injections of botulinum, uh, toxin were injected up to levels of 40, the blood levels of 40 times the estimated lethal human dose. Fortunately, all fa four of these uh, patients survived. Uh, so these famous episodes strike us as horrible injustices that must be prevented. However, um, by 1988, it was well established that aspirin greatly reduced the risk of myocardial occlusion. But for years, the FDA forbade aspirin makers from advertising that fact. By restricting, by this restriction alone, the FDA surely killed tens and quite possibly hundreds of thousands of Americans. The FDA delays, it is suggested by this libertarian group, delays, stifles, and suppresses life-saving drugs and devices. These drugs here were all uh, put on the slow track to success. And had they been used more quickly, more urgently, uh, there would have been, again, tens of thousands of lives might well have been saved. It's also a fact that in 1987, a study cataloged 192 generic and over 1,500 brand name tested drugs available abroad but not approved in the United States. Thousands of drugs, thousands, are never discovered nor developed. And it's impossible to estimate the actual negative consequences, but again, it is said that a huge number of people are disadvantaged physically uh, because of the lack of development. But we should rejoice in the fact that thalidomide never made it to the U.S. mass market. Safety is not a yes or no issue. Is chemotherapy safe? Medicine is often a poison. In uh, 1994, adverse reactions to FDA-approved drugs killed over 100,000 hospital patients. This is well-established and well-accepted. In 1998, 
130 people uh, died while on Viagra. I must say, that doesn't sound like a bad way to go. <laughs> so why do we need the FDA? Few FDA approved drugs are flagrantly unsafe, true. But there's nothing inherently different about the safety of a medical device versus the safety of a non-medical device. Many aspects of drug safety could be certified and assured by independent groups uh, and also supported by the tort system. Uh, for instance, how is safety assured in other industries? You know, in electronics, for instance, and other areas, the underwriters group, which is an independent uh, group, it's a private organization, uh, grants its safety mark to products that pass inspection. Uh, it, they pay for it. It's a service. They're rapid. They're paid. They're paid for success, but they're paid for getting it right. Uh, and uh, manufacturers, uh, it's voluntary. Manufacturers may actually sell items without the UL mark, but retailers and distributors prefer the products with it for obvious reasons. Uh, further, this is a letter that was, it's a redacted letter to Representative uh, Dingle. Um, this came up last year. A group of eight scientists working in the FDA's Center for Devices and Radiological Health Division has revolted against the corrupt managers of its own department. Now, this is a serious issue. They accuse them of committing crimes by claiming there is extensive documentary evidence that managers have corrupted and interfered with the scientific review of medical devices, that managers ordered experts to change their opinions and conclusions in violation of the law, that the FDA often approves complex medical devices on the basis of little evidence of effectiveness, and the nation is at risk if the FDA science is at risk, and that this misconduct reached the highest levels of the FDA.